Hey everyone, it's Saoirse, and today we're going to talk about a best-selling book that has just gained some more popularity because it's been made into a movie. This is Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. I've had this on my shelf for quite a while. This was my mom's copy, and if you know me by now, um, I collect books to an almost terrifying extent, and um, that means I have over a hundred that are just on my shelf that I haven't read. So I hadn't been getting to this one, and the movie coming out gave me a little um, a little kick in the pants, and I decided to read it before I saw the movie. So um, I always thought when I looked at it that this was going to be a kind of average crime fiction novel, which isn't really my thing. I prefer true crime. So I think it might be marketed a bit wrong. I think it's much more of a coming-of-age story, and so it really appealed to me in that sense. Now I also have my North Carolina mug today because this book is set in North Carolina. I have a real soft spot for North Carolina. I grew up going there, have gone there every year of my life, and um, I love it. It's my other home. But I only know the Blue Ridge Mountains region of North Carolina, so this whole introduction to the coast and the marsh and the swamp is kind of totally beyond what I know about North Carolina. Um, we are in my jungle room today. It is not a marsh room or a swamp room, but I live in Florida, so we are technically in a swamp. Yay. So I'll read you the jacket here before we dig in just in case you have no idea what this book is about. For years, rumors of the Marsh Girl have haunted Barkley Cove, a quiet town on the North Carolina coast. So in late 1969, when handsome Chase Andrews is found dead, the locals immediately suspect Kaya Clark, the so-called Marsh Girl. But Kaya is not what they say. Sensitive and intelligent, she has survived for years alone in the marsh that she calls home, finding friends in the gulls and lessons in the sand. Then the time comes when she yearns to be touched and loved. When two young men from town become intrigued by her wild beauty, Kaya opens herself to a new life until the unthinkable happens. Perfect for fans of Barbara Kingsolver and Karen Russell, where the crawdads sing is at once an exquisite ode to the natural world, a heartbreaking coming-of-age story, and a surprising tale of possible murder, Owens reminds us that we are forever shaped by the children we once were, and that we are all subject to the beautiful and violent secrets that nature keeps. So I was kind of drawn to the idea of this being a good piece of nature writing. The author had co-written a few books that were um, non-fiction, I believe from her time living in Africa. And um, so you can kind of tell, there are some things about this book that give away that it's her first novel, um, but that's fine. That doesn't make it bad. I really, really loved it and enjoyed it. Um, it definitely grew on me as it went on, and it's an interesting sort of plot, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say, structure, because it like starts where you have a couple of different timelines, and then they keep going and keep going back and forth until they meet in the middle. So you've got um, Kaya's childhood, and then the future where she's going to be um, convicted for this murder. And so you see all the police work happening, and then you jump back to Kaya growing up, and then eventually those timelines meet up, um, which I thought was kind of cool. The movie did it very differently. It right away just threw you into, um, here's Kaya getting, getting convicted for this crime, and then she meets her lawyer, and she starts to tell her life story through that lawyer or to that lawyer. Um, which I thought was a little contrived, but I guess, I don't know, maybe it would have been too confusing visually to do the structure that she did in the book. So anyway, this is written in third person, and you know I usually don't love third person. I prefer a good character study where we are in their brain, but I really think she did a good job of digging into this character, even though it's third person. I didn't feel like, I didn't feel like I needed it to be first person. I felt like she did such a good job of of making us feel what Kaya was feeling um, 
And then by making it third person, she also had the advantage of being able to write scenes that were not Kaya-centric. But I don't really know if that was necessary because they did seem a bit out of place. Like a couple scenes with Tate and his dad, it was like, this is weird. This is weird because you're usually focused on Kaya. Anyway, that's just a tangent. Um, let's dig into some bits from the book and some thoughts about them. And there will be spoilers coming up. The first few, not really spoilery, but then obviously as the book goes on, you know, if you don't want to know what happens later on, then don't listen. So this is near the beginning. Um, and Kaya is by herself. When the carton was empty, she didn't think she could stand the pain, so afraid they would leave her like everybody else. But the gulls squatted on the beach around her and went about their business of preening their grey extended wings. So she sat down too and wished she could gather them up and take them with her to the porch to sleep. She imagined them all packed in her bed, a fluffy bunch of warm feathered bodies under the covers together. So this book is kind of unbearably sad for a lot of it. Um, if you've ever had abandonment issues, um, loneliness problems, um, if you were kind of a solo child, if you've been a loner, it's going to be kind of hard reading some of these descriptions. Um, but she does such a wonderful job at evoking these feelings and and describing what, what it's like to be that deeply lonely. Like, the depth of her isolation is tangible. Um, and that's, that's hard to do, you know, without just saying over and over she's lonely. Um, these descriptions, like her wanting to just gather up the seagulls and sleep with them in her bed, it's so freaking sad. Months passed, winter easing gently into place, as southern winters do. The sun, warm as a blanket, wrapped Kaya's shoulders, coaxing her deeper into the marsh. Sometimes she heard night sounds she didn't know, or jumped from lightning too close, but whenever she stumbled, it was the land that caught her. Until at last, at some unclaimed moment, the heart pain seeped away like water into sand. Still there, but deep. Kaya laid her hand upon the breathing wet earth, and the marsh became her mother. <sighs> All the, um, I mean, she has mommy issues and daddy issues. It's, it's so painful. But I love that description. That, that really hit me. There's not a whole ton of, um, of really impressive language to me. Like, there's good descriptions, but in terms of, like, stating things in a way that I'd never heard before, um, there isn't a whole bunch of that, but this one, this one was one of those moments. Because it's a great way to explain that pain in your heart, that it goes away, but it's still there. It's just deep, just like when you make a footprint in sand and then the water takes it. Um, yeah. The marsh became her mother. I mean, she's so connected to nature. And I just, I don't know, she just really characterizes her well that you can, you can see her. And this character could have very easily been a manic pixie dream girl, marsh girl. But I don't think she quite became that, which is great. Because that's just such a, what is it, archetype? The archetype or whatever. Um, where Tate teaches Kaya to read. Um, he says, you can read, Kaya. There will never be a time again when you can't read. It ain't just that. She spoke almost in a whisper. I wasn't aware that words could hold so much. I didn't know a sentence could be so full. I just liked that. The power of reading. Um, I just, I can't imagine being somebody that doesn't like to read because I always have. But I know there are people who have to find the right book or the right story for them. And that moment when you when you realize that this isn't just boring black and white words on a page that your parents are making you read or your school is making you read, you realize that there are things that you can learn from it and things that it can make you feel. That is so powerful. Here come some spoilery moments, I think. 
So this bit where she is talking about fireflies and how female fireflies change their their like blinking code. Um, one of the females had changed her code. First she flashed the proper sequence of dashes and dots, attracting a male of her species, and they mated. Then she flickered a different signal, and a male of a different species flew to her. Reading her message, the second male was convinced he'd found a willing female of his own kind, and hovered above her to mate. But suddenly the female firefly reached up, grabbed him with her mouth, and ate him, chewing all six legs and both wings. Kaya watched others. The females got what they wanted. First a mate, then a meal, just by changing their signals. And then it says, Kaya knew judgment had no place here. Evil was not in play, just life pulsing on, even at the expense of some of the players. Biology sees right and wrong as the same color in different light. So, here we have um, some excellent foreshadowing, and it comes, page 142, um, I think at a pretty good point where I didn't catch it, and I'd be interested to know if you have read this book, did you, did you catch on to what the twist was going to be at the end? Because I definitely didn't. Um, so I think she spun it in a good way where I didn't expect what was going to happen in the end, but that seeing the fireflies and um, and thinking about nature and how nature is not evil, so it wouldn't be evil to take out a predator that is, you know, um, threatening your life. And in the end, that is what she does. We find out that she did, in fact, kill Chase Andrews. And it's very satisfying when when you kind of relate it back to the earlier bits and you think about why she did that and, like, why, why was that her choice and not um, going to the police or continuing to run and hide from him. She knew from watching nature that it wasn't going to change, that she was going to be his prey forever if she didn't do something about it. Um, so I like how it's sort of justified throughout the book. Not that murder is justified, but everything he did to her was not justified either. And, um, you know, we can have a little discussion about how we feel about revenge. Let's see, I don't think it was revenge in her case. It was, um, it was self-preservation. Because I don't see her as a vengeful person, just somebody who has learned how to survive on every level by herself. Okay, where are we? Um, so here, there's this really interesting description of where she lies down in the water. It says, suddenly she shrieks as the power rushes beneath her, fondles her thighs between her legs, flows along her back, swirling under her head, pulling her hair in inky strands. She rolls faster into the deepening wave, against streaming shells and ocean bits, the water embracing her. Pushing against the sea's strong body, she is grasped, held, not alone. So there we get, like, not just the land around her being her friend, but it's almost sexual. Um, so she's got, she's got a mother in the marsh, that's what it said before. Then we have this kind of sexually charged moment with the water. Um, and it's, the whole marsh is her friend, so she's got every sort of human um, companion that you could want just in this place where she lives. Which I think is just, oh, that's just a, I don't know. It's great. I have no adjectives today. It's so, it's just so deeply sad, but also impressive that she, um, she can do that. She can, like, you, it's the human spirit, okay? It's the human spirit. We continue on even in the most bleak of situations. And even those of us who say that we're loners and we prefer our own company, when, it, when the isolation is this extreme, you're in a shack in a marsh where the nearest town is a few miles away and, like, your only visitors are going to be people trying to kill you or do horrible things to you. Um, yeah, that's real loneliness. So, then we get right into this poet, Amanda Hamilton, 
It says, Kaya recalled a poem written by a lesser known poet, Amanda Hamilton, published recently in the local newspaper she'd bought at the Piggly Wiggly. And then throughout the book, we get all these poems by Amanda, Amanda Hamilton. And maybe I should have clocked it when it said local newspaper and all the poems were really apt for the moment and the things that Kaya was experiencing. Um, I, I was almost at the point of Googling Amanda Hamilton because I was like, who in the world is this? And how did she get the permission to print so many of her poems? I really thought it was a real poet. Um, and I was also thinking, like, these poems aren't, they aren't that great. Like, what is this? And so then when we learn at the end that Amanda Hamilton is actually Kaya, it's like, what? Okay, it makes sense. It's a weird, um plot device that I guess looking at the movie and how they, they didn't use that that um, storyline at all it kind of makes sense because it wasn't really necessary it wasn't really necessary but there are a lot of things that aren't necessary to a plot that are just something to put into the story and why not um, so I don't have a problem with it it definitely fooled me I did not think that it was her Okay, here's a, a bit where we get the very stark difference between Tate and Chase. <sighs> um, nothing could stop the burning shame of sharps and sharp sadness. A simple hope of being with someone, of actually being wanted, of being touched, had drawn her in. But these hurried, groping hands were only a taking, not a sharing or giving. It, oh, it's so painful to read the scenes with her and Chase after having just read the magical scenes with her and Tate. I mean, Tate, like, what a dream boy, right? He, he shows you the way home, he teaches you how to read, um, he's, he's, like, all kind and sensitive about explaining her period to her and, um, you know, sharing their first sexual experience, and he's, he's just, he's so precious. And then you have this horrible Chase, who you know is trying to get with her so that he can brag about being her first. Um, he's so absolutely repulsive on every level. I hate him so much. Um, yeah, but the, the differences are just... Whew. I felt like in the movie the casting was a little bit weird, because they just looked kind of too similar. Like, their haircuts were too similar. I wanted Tate to have his curly, crazy hair. Um, and also... Chase and, I think Chase and Kaya were both British, um, which is, like, they couldn't, I mean, they were good, and you wouldn't know it, but they couldn't have found people who were really, you know, from this area of the South. I don't know, I thought it would have been, it would have been cool and more authentic, but they did a good job. That's, like, another little gripe of mine, little women casting all non-American girls to play the four sisters. I was just like, really? We could? Okay. Famous American novel. But some people can really pull it off. Um, where are we going? 63. Oh yeah, so Chase just keeps getting worse. Um, Kaya turned quickly to speed away, but against a strong pull, turned back and searched for him. She knew that no part of this yearning made sense. Illogical behavior to fill an emptiness would not fulfill much more. How much do you trade to defeat lonesomeness? So she was just, she was not into this boy, like, let's be honest. And she feels herself just completely losing herself. Um, there's another bit here. It says, she laughed for his sake, something she'd never done, giving away another piece of herself just to have someone else. Ooh, haven't we kind of all been there? If you haven't been there, then you're lucky. Um, but sometimes we meet people that just either manipulate us or or make us feel like, well, at least we've got this person, um, to the point where we just give up little bits and pieces of ourselves, and then depending on how invested we are with this person, it can take a very long time to get those pieces back. Here's a red flag. Chase was her first visitor since Tate, who had seemed as natural and accepting as other marsh creatures. 
With Chase, she felt exposed, as if someone were filleting her like a fish. Shame welled up inside. She kept her back to him, but felt him move around the room, followed by the familiar creaks of the floor. Um, red flag, red flag. You know, you feel so safe and accepted and good with this one person, and and then this other guy comes along, and you feel like a filleted fish. So, let me just say, if anybody out there is in a situation where they feel like a filleted fish, that person's probably not right for you, if they're making you feel that way. Um, and I know I'm the queen of ignoring red flags and making excuses for them, so I know it's hard. But damn, nobody wants to feel like a filleted fish. It's... Ugh. Go Tate. He's so great. Well, except for, you know what, I do hate what Tate did to her. I loved Tate before he left, and I loved him years and years later, but when he didn't come and meet her on the 4th of July... Man, I understand her anger. I would be angry kind of forever. <laughs> like, how could you do that to me? Um, and it was really big of her to eventually forgive him. And to trust him again, because that's the hard part. Even if you forgive somebody, you can't... you don't always trust them again. Okay, um, it says nature is audacious enough to ensure that the males who send out dishonest signals or go from one female to the next almost always end up alone. And I wrote, boom, roasted. Uh, yeah, I love, I love how she talks about in nature, um, the animals that go strutting around with all their ridiculous plumage and stuff, they're usually having to stoop to these means to attract a mate because they are the less, um, the actually, like, less impressive specimen. Uh, I think it was frogs, maybe, that the little sad, pathetic ones will sit next to the ones with the big rivet, and they will wait for the females to come and, and say, like, oh, who's making that good rivet over there? And then the pathetic rivet ones will swoop in and be like, hey, it was me. Um, it just makes me think of guys with with really big trucks. Those trucks that are just raised up to like 10 stories high. I just look at those and I think, what are you overcompensating for? Let's see. Oh, this got me. I cried a few times in this book. Not Not too much throughout, like, oh, the beginning was making me sad, but I wasn't downright crying, but here, um, after she gets her book published, which is so impressive, by the way, she, oh, okay, I'm so confused, yeah, she's, she gives the book to Jumpin', and I just, I love her connection with Jumpin' and Mabel, um, she gives it to him, he stared at her, in another time and place, an old black man and a young white woman might have hugged, but not there, not then. She covered his hand with hers, turned and motored away. It was the first time she'd seen him speechless. She kept on buying gas and supplies from him, but never accepted a handout from them again. And each time she came to his wharf, she saw her book propped up in the tiny window for all to see, as a father would have shown it. Everybody else with daddy issues, did you cry at that part? Just... You know, a father figure being proud of her. Imagine what that felt, how that felt to her after losing her whole family. And not to, you know, a tragedy where they all died, but to just them abandoning her. It's so much worse in a way when, when it's a choice. There's a good bit here about human nature. Um, it says, some behaviors that seem harsh to us now ensured the survival of early man in whatever swamp he was in at the time. Without them, we wouldn't be here. We still store those instincts in our genes, and they express themselves when certain circumstances prevail. Some parts of us will always be what we were, what we had to be to survive, way back yonder. So again, sprinkling in a little more of, like, this is why it's okay that she's going to murder somebody. Um, because she'll, she'll be doing what she has to, to survive. Lots of interesting little sciencey tidbits in here. 
you know, I enjoy when I can when I can learn some things while reading fiction. Well, there's a nice part where um, Jody finally comes back, and then he's driving away. It says he waved from the truck window all the way down the lane as she watched, crying and laughing all at once. And when he turned onto the track, she could see his red pickup through the holes of the forest, where a white scarf had once trailed away, his long arm waving until he was gone. So I love in books where they do a little callback to an earlier bit, and we remember that image of her mother's scarf as her mother abandoned her, and now she gets to kind of patch this painful memory with something new which is seeing her brother finally come back to her and um, he's driving away in his red pickup and she knows she'll see him again. Wow, I have a lot more notes than I thought. Um, here's, uh, really, this is one of those interesting descriptions. Um, Kaya is looking into the microscope that Tate has. Kaya leaned over gently as if to kiss a baby. The microscope's light reflected in her dark pupils and she drew in a breath as a Mardi Gras of costumed players pirouetted and careened into view. Unimaginable headdresses adorned astonishing bodies so eager for more life they frolicked as though caught in a circus tent, not a single bead of water. That's a really cool way to picture a bunch of nasty little amoebas. Um, because, like, you can look at it as this is just so gross to see how much is going on in, in a drop of water and what is in the water that I'm drinking and bathing in and all that. Um, but they're little Mardi Gras people just having a great time and dancing. It surely gives you, like, different perspectives. And she shows you, by juxtaposing the way that Kaya and Tate look at nature um, to the way that somebody like Chase and pretty much the rest of town looks at nature. Which is to be generally scared of it. And uninterested. Okay, here's a good bit. Cats! Cat bit. Um, where she's in her cell and Sunday Justice, the cat, is keeping her company. I, l I love this whole scene because it's so desperately sad and so adorable. Um, you know, the cat's sniffing around the cell, it's kind of just doing its own thing, and she's sitting there frozen like, please, please come and be with me, I'm so alone. Um, and then he gets up on the bed and gets on her lap. It says, Kaya sat frozen, her arms slightly raised so as not to interfere with his maneuvering. And how many of us with cats have done that, where you're just like, I will let you do whatever you want, you get comfortable, I will never move again. Because you have to, like, they're cats, you gotta let them have what they want, they deserve it. Um, finally he settled as though he had nested here every night of his life. He looked at her. Gently she touched his head, then scratched his neck. A loud purr erupted like a current. She closed her eyes at such easy acceptance, a deep pause in a lifetime of longing. Oh my god, cats are magic. She has this whole lonely lifetime, and then she gets a little break from her loneliness because this cat is so accepting and, and so willing to love and comfort. Cats are so special. Okay. Um, agony ripped her. Finally, after a lifetime, she admitted it was the chance of seeing Tate, the hope of rounding a creek bend and watching him through the reeds that had pulled her into the marsh every day of her life since she was seven. She knew his favorite lagoons and paths through difficult quagmires, always following him at a safe distance, sneaking about, stealing love, never sharing it. You can't get hurt when you love someone from the other side of an estuary. All the years she rejected him, she survived because he was somewhere in the marsh, waiting. But now perhaps he would no longer be there. Um, this, oh, isn't it so frustrating once you kind of, as the reader, you forgive Tate a little bit um, and it takes Kaya a longer time? Isn't it so frustrating? You're just like, come on, you guys are supposed to be together. Um, but it is so hard to love in the first place and then to trust as well. Like I said before, 
to rebuild trust with somebody that you loved and put all of your faith in and they either abandoned or betrayed you, it's really freaking hard to build that back up, especially for somebody like her who has lived her whole life alone and knows exactly how to be alone and, you know, maybe wouldn't prefer to be alone, but she knows that she can survive that way and generally it, it's safer in her experience. Oh, I just liked this little description of um, the graveyard. The Barkley Cove graveyard trailed off under tunnels of dark oaks. Spanish moss hung in long curtains, creating cave-like cave -like sanctuaries for old tombstones. The remains of a family here, a loner there, in no order at all. Fingers of gnarled roots had torn and twisted gravestones into hunched and nameless forms. Markers of death, all weathered into nubbins by elements of life. In the distance, the sea and sky sang too bright for the serious ground. I just love a good, a little juxtaposition. Markers of life, um, elements of death, or sorry, the complete opposite. Markers of death, the gravestones, being worn down by the elements of life. It's like, it just, no matter who dies and what happens, the world keeps going. And that you don't have to look at that as like, it's indifferent. Um, it's just kind of the theme of this whole book that that life finds a way. <gasps> That's it. That's the point of this book. I've just figured it out. Um, you know, I like to look for a sort of one sentence description of like the point that a book is making. And I kind of feel like that's it for this one. Life finds a way no matter what. Okay, the last couple of ones here. Here's another crying moment. Oh, I'm always I'm always crying about about jumping. I just the relationship is so sweet. Okay, so of course he has to get killed off, which sucks. Um, Mabel rushed to Kaya. They hugged, rocking back and forth, crying. Lord, he loved you like his own daughter. Mabel said, "I know," Kaya said, and he was my pa. And he was my pa. Like, he, she's never said that throughout the book. Like, Jumpin' and Mabel had their own kids. He didn't call Kaya his daughter, but they all kind of knew it. And, oh my god, that destroyed me. He was my pa. <laughs> Ouch. Okay. What does that say? Oh. I write my notes with a dry erase marker and sometimes, you know, my, my handwriting is bad enough, but put a dry erase marker in my hands. Um, so this is at the end, the very last page, after Chase discovers that his wife, well, we weren't really technically married, but basically um, his wife did in fact kill this boy way back a long time ago, because at this point they're in their 60s. Um, and he takes the shell necklace that is the whole, like, crux of the, the court case, and nobody can find this shell necklace, and here it is, right here in this hidden under the floorboards box. What is that moment like, when you, you think you've known something as truth for so many years, and then you find out it wasn't, but at the same time, you're like, my wife was a badass, and she did the right thing. But also, whoa, she never told me that. Um, anyway, so he puts the, he drops the shell onto the sand and it gets taken by the water. Um, the tide was coming in and a wave flowed over his feet, taking with it hundreds of seashells back into the sea. Kaya had been of this land and of this water. Now they would take her back, keep her secrets deep. So I love that because Kaya, um, she was a marsh creature, and she was always just protecting herself, and all of her secrets and everything are returned back to where they belong in the marsh. So, yes, I already talked about some of the film differences, like cutting Amanda Hamilton. Um, Chase and Tate had a, a little interaction, which never happened. They tussled, and... 
the way that they showed the red wool hat, it they I think they were showing it in that kind of tussling thing, because um, Jumpin grabs it and he wipes it on his shirt, and you're just like, ooh, are these fibers? Um, I think they did that because they were trying to show the fire the fibers from the hat could be on anybody at this point, so any one of these people could be the person who murdered um, Chase. They were trying to put it in our minds that either Tate or Jumpin, which very likely candidates, could have been the ones that murdered him. Yes. Um, in the book, though, there is no altercation like that. So we just see them, Tate and Kaya, throwing this hat back and forth to each other, playing around. Um, but as soon as the we see the police find the hat at her house in the book, at that point, I should have known that she did it. I should have known later on and remembered that and thought, oh, well, she had the hat. So obviously she did it. Because how else would those fibers have ever gotten on there if she'd just recently gotten this hat? Um, but for some reason, I didn't figure it out. I mean, it shocked me at the end. Because I thought... I don't know, I thought they were going to tell us. I was like, oh, really? We're never going to find out? I thought maybe he did just fall off, or... Or maybe Tate did it, and he's... But then I thought, why would Tate let Kaya go through this um, trial? Anyway, I don't know. For me, it was a good little mystery, but the, the whole mystery part of it wasn't the point of the book. Like, I could see that she was she was trying to appeal to a lot of audiences, because you've got coming of age, you've got romance, and you've got crime. Um... That's a lot of stuff wrapped up into one book, but it really worked. And I can see why this became a bestseller and so popular for book clubs. Um, so some thoughts about it. I was thinking Kaya never went to school, so she learned how to problem solve from nature. She was always watching the animals do what they do and, and how they solve things. So the murder, if you look at it through that lens, is understandable because she felt completely cornered. And this is a person who is more, like, more of a wild creature than, you know, somebody who lives in society. She doesn't fit in in the town. She doesn't try to. And good for her. But <clears throat> it is sad to see throughout the book that she never, never really trusts people there and, and doesn't give any other kind of life a chance. And I don't mean, like, integrating into that awful town. Um, but things like taking so long to push herself to go meet her editor. Um, she clearly was a gifted illustrator and writer and, oh my lord have mercy, I just lost power in my house. Yeah, my power just completely went out. Okay, we're gonna do the rest of this in the dark. There's been some storms, so. Well, that's nice. Anyway, Kaya didn't have any power in her shack until she got money. So, I have lost my train of thought now because of that. It's gonna get hot in here because like I said, Florida and oh my god, my AC is out. All right, please say some prayers for me. It's gonna get sweaty. Okay, anyway, so the title of the book, where the crawdad's saying, I read this review where somebody was so bitter about it. They were so, they were like, crawdads don't sing. They were mad about every aspect of this book. Clearly they had like, some sort of vendetta, I don't know why. Um, but that title, it's, a, it's not literal. She she explains what it means. Where the crawdads sing means like when pigs fly. Like it's a ridiculous thing. It just means way out in the middle of nowhere because that's where the crawdads would sing because they don't sing here. Anyway, I just thought I would mention that. This review is so whack. Um, so yeah, I do recommend this book, although it is deeply, deeply sad for most of it. Um, but the ending is so satisfying. I think if, if she had not ended up with Tate, I would have, what did I say? Oh, I would have lost it. Um, yeah, I would have had a little riot. Like, I just, I needed her to end up with Tate, so I'm glad that that happens. Um, though it is kind of like a neat tying it in a bow for the ending. I don't care. That's what we need after hundreds of pages of absolute misery. Um, so, oh yes, this scene at the end of the movie, it gets me so good. Have you guys seen this? 
when Kaya is an older woman and she's going out into the marsh because I think like a creature she knows she's gonna die and then it flashes to um, her mom, this vision of her mom walking away, or not walking away, but like coming back being like, hey, come with me, you know, come to heaven sort of thing. And and then it's in the boat, it's little, little Kaya now, and she's looking at her mother. <laughs> and then it's teenage Kaya, and then it's old woman Kaya, and they're all like, mommy. Um, I got goosebumps just thinking about it. That was the most powerful image of the movie for me because it really captured this lesson in the book that that I kept thinking about, which is that the inner child never dies. And throughout the book, we, we keep feeling like, yes, this, this person has grown into a woman, but she's absolutely still that little girl whose mother left, and she will always be that. Um, it was heartbreaking. So, yes, I, I loved it, and... I'm glad I finally got around to it. I tend to be a little bit like, hmm, about things that have a lot of hype and some things, expectation, like the expectation of how good it will be doesn't usually, the reality doesn't usually live up to it. Um, but I liked it. So what are your thoughts on this book? Um, I hope you're not as mad as that one person about the title. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would love to know your thoughts, and if you saw the movie, how did it compare? I thought it wasn't spectacular, but there were some nice moments. Uh, it was strange at the end, in the credits, when it said it was filmed in Louisiana. I'm like, really? So you got a couple of British people and you filmed it in Louisiana? Like, you couldn't have, you couldn't have filmed it in North Carolina? Was it too expensive? Could you not find the right marsh? That was a bit sad. But anyway... That is all for now, and I'm going to try and sort out how to get my power back on. Because it's like 95 degrees outside, so that's not, that's not good. Um, until next time, happy reading, everyone. Thanks for watching.